Well, okay, we're in the, we're con in the uh, continuation of Paul's missionary journey, his third missionary journey. But the la in the last session, there was a little anecdote put at the end of the uh, chapter 18 uh, that really was a setup for chapter 19. So let's go back and pick it up about verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. So he's quite a guy. There's many, many scholars that are really interested in tracing, learning more about him. And he's very effective. Now this incident that's going to record here is obviously a prelude to the first seven verses of chapter 19. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. In other words, what he knew he dealt with very positively, very eloquently. But unfortunately, he only understood up to that point. He had no concept of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he was, you would say he's a believer, but not there yet. So, and uh, he was, the word fervent there really means boiling hot and uh, in the way of the Lord. Now, John the Baptist taught three great truths. Forgiveness of sins on the basis of repentance. In fact, only on the basis of repentance expressing that all through baptism, that was his, his uh, mark of his ministry. And he pointed to one who was coming to complete their salvation. And uh, what's missing, though, from John the Baptist's presentation, if you were a disciple of just John the Baptist, that's as far as you went. What was missing in your program was the cross, because, of course, that hadn't happened yet during, John's uh, during his ministry. In fact, he was executed before the cross. And... Uh, Therefore, the resurrection was not part of his perspective, and uh, certainly the Holy Spirit's baptism had not uh, occurred yet. So three things he had, but three things he was short, and they point to the shortages uh, that Apollos was uh, suffering from. So anyway, Apollos began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly or to say it more politely, more completely. The word perfect there is used in the sense of completeness. And uh, he certainly was incomplete. And uh, so it's very providential that Priscilla and Achilla was left in Ephesus to encounter him. So he, they were the right people at the right place at the right time. And that's usually the, that's the handiwork of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's also impressive. This guy, Apollos, is very impressive for several uh, reasons. He's obviously very bright obviously very eloquent, but he had an attribute that is probably more important than any of those. He had humility. He was open to correction. And that's a challenge for all of us, to always be open, always be listening. The teachable will always be humble. Humility is always warded. And so he received that, and he became a mighty evangelist, and he went on to Achaia, that is the area of Greece and Corinth and so forth. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah. Okay. Okay, of course, the capital of that whole province was Corinth itself. And uh, so, so after spend, uh, meanwhile, <coughs> we'll pick it up now, uh, chapter 19, and Paul is in Antioch. He, re, he then goes ahead and he, he revisits all the churches throughout Galatia and Phrygia in that order. Uh, he always goes back and visits them to encourage them and so forth. And Paul then in Ephesus, he makes Ephesus his base of operations for three years. And that will cover the first seven verses of the, the chapter. And... Uh, the disciples of Apollos will receive the Holy Spirit. The church is founded in the following verses. So let's pick it up now in chapter 19, verse 1. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that this is all derives from Apollos, who was uh, indebted to a very plain couple, Achilla and Priscilla, from their earlier meeting. Now, is it, now, we're in the province of Asia, of course, which included the western part of Asia Minor. And the Romans took this country about 130 B.C. 
And finally, the name was extended. Finally, the uh, name uh, of Asia is extended to the whole continent. And it was, of course, the jewel of the Roman Empire, along with Africa. So thus, it was what's called a senatorial province. It was full of great cities that are very prominent in the Bible. Uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, the seven churches um, of Revelation 2 and 3 are here. But also Colossae, Hier Hierapolis, Apamea, uh, uh, to go further. And uh, Hellenism had full sway there. So uh, Ephesus was the capital of this area and the chief city. It was richer and larger than Corinth. So Ephesus is a very important place. And it was located at the entrance of the valley of the Meander to the east. Here was the power of Rome and the splendor of Greek culture and the full tide of Oriental superstition and magic. The Temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the world. We'll be talking quite a bit about Artemis or Diana. They get confused because one is Greek and one is Rome. And they, have, they both use the same word, names in reverse. But we'll get that, that here. While in Ephesus... Some hold that Paul at this time wrote the epistle to the Galatians after his recent visit there. Some that he did it uh, before his visit to Jerusalem, but whichever. Second verse then. <clears throat> he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much her as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. You see, these disciples of Apollos were suffering from the same deficiencies that Apollo had, although Apollo's situation had been corrected when he was in Corinth. Now he's, uh, th th these guys are in Ephesus suffering from the same deficiency in effect, okay? The Holy Spirit did you receive in believing is the question. And that's the, uh, Paul deals with that in Romans 8, by the way. And he said to them, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. In other words, their understanding didn't go any further than John the Baptist. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And uh, so, see, uh, from, from in terms of John's baptism, Christ and salvation was rather expected than having actually come. And that's what makes all the difference. And so, see, the Old Testament actually ends in Luke 16, 16. The Old Testament ends with John the Baptist. John the Baptist is regarded as the last of the Old Testament prophets. And so he's, that's, we're talking New Testament now. We're talking post-resurrection now. And, and the whole issue is the Holy Spirit. We, we're going to explore five verbs of the Holy Spirit. And uh, there are four of them that are used in the singular sense, an event that occurs once and only once. Born of the Spirit into the family in John 3, of course. That happens once in a lifetime. If you're born, you're born. You don't need to be born again uh, a second time. If you're born, you're born is the idea. And uh, you're baptized of the Spirit into the body once and for all. 2 Corinthians 12 deals with that. You're indwelt by the Spirit living in us. And that's permanent. In fact, without repentance. That's the thing that amazed Paul. And he hammers that away in several places, especially in Ephesians. But it comes up, of course, also in Romans 8. And you're sealed. Not only are you indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but you're sealed by the Spirit unto redemption. In Ephesians 1 and 3 and 4 and on it goes. So those four verbs are used in a once and for all sense. But there's another verb that is repeat, a repeated experience in your walk. And that is the filling of the Spirit. And that's what Ephesians 5 talks about. And that's essential to understand. There's a lot of confusion about this. Uh, uh, the, the use of the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you to do your own study. Pay very close attention to both the prepositions and the verbs. Here are the verbs. Four of them are a once and for all event. The last one I mentioned is something that you seek again and again and again if you're going to be an overcomer. And there's much to say about that. The prepositions he, he, is whether he's, whether he's in you, indwelling in you, upon you, and so forth. And so... Now, are we a contradiction is the question. Are, are, do we have union without communion is the question. Do we have profession without experience? Big difference between professing it and actually having experienced it. Do we have life without health? It's another way to ask it. Do we have movement without actual progress? Do we have battles but without victory? 
Do we have service without success? Do we have trials without triumph? Each one of these imply or raise the question of, have you been filled with the Spirit? You may be saved, but are you filled with the Spirit? And uh, are you on the right side of Easter, but on the wrong side of Pentecost? Are you on the right side of pardon, but on the wrong side of power? Are you justified, but not yet sanctified? That's a, there's a big debate in the Christian body about the use of these terms. When my wife and I published the Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory, it was amazing how divisive that was in some areas. And the, the fact that sanctification is a work in progress. Justification is once and for all. Jesus did it on the cross. All my sins were paid for then. When am I sanctified? That's never finished. Continually growing. And uh, all, all of us need to continually raise the bar on our walk. And if you want an in-depth study of the gift of the Spirit, we suggest you can get our briefing package on the spiritual gifts or simply go to our commentary in the book of Corinthians. Both 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 deal with this issue. Well, let's move on to verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and he spake boldly for a space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. That was fine for a while, but then, verse 9, when the divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of Tyrannius. This guy, Tyrannius. In other words, in the synagogue, he did fine for a while until the Judaizers ganged up on him, got hardened and fought with him and so forth. So he uh, departed from them, went next door to, for, and, and got some space, a place that's called the School of Tyrannus. Tyrannus. And uh, notice, they speak evil of the way. They didn't have denominational names. Um, they, they, called, they spoke of it as the way. And uh, it was a, a, a subset in their minds at least, of Judaism. It was that, the, that particular way of dealing with things. But who is the way? Jesus is the, the way is a person. I am the way, the truth and life, Jesus claimed. So that was a term you'll find used several times in the scripture. And we tend to use the term today, Christians or believers. But they, they call it the way. And uh, these guys spake evil of the way. And that's going to be, uh, they're in Ephesus, and you'll, you'll discover that Paul, before he leaves Ephesus, is going to really preach to them, to the, to the elders there. And it's clear when you look at Jesus' letter to Ephesus in Revelation 2, that they apparently heeded that instruction. And they, they watched out, they were on the guard for false teachers and so forth. No, Jesus said, I am the way. And that's where we get that phrase. And uh, now the school of Tyrannus was used as, by Paul as an outreach throughout the province uh, for uh, two years. And uh, verse 10, and this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. That's quite a sentence. That uh, the word, all those that dwelt in Asia heard the word. They really turned the world upside down. Now, <clears throat> we also understand that he, had, he may have had an unrecorded visit to Corinth since the one next recorded is twice called his third visit, if you're tracking his repeated visits to Corinth. Um, and during the close of this long stay, this two-year stay here, he wrote 1 Corinthians. And he also, many scholars believe, that's also when he wrote Galatians. And uh, <clears throat> it was perhaps the most productive period of Paul's life in the minds of some. Others would argue that his imprisonment in Rome, which led to the uh, prison epistles, was even more productive. But the school of Tyrannus, and we want to understand this guy. <clears throat> the term actually means our tyrant, but it was a common term uh, in, in that area. And there is an inscription on the columbarium of the uh, Empress Livia as that uh, uh, it was a physician in the court. That's maybe where they picked this up. And another scholar suggests the possibility that a relative of this physician was lecturing on medicine in Ephesus and so was a friend of Luke, of Luke, Luke being a doctor. This may have been a friend of Luke, and that may be why 
Luke was able to arrange this, this school, a, a space. The, it, Paul may have been given the space or he may have been able to rent it for a modest fee because he's there for several years. So it would be helpful to Paul to have a place to preach. And it's next door to the synagogue. They weren't welcome in the Jewish community, so he's down the street here. Probably a public building or lecture hall and uh, hired by Paul or loaned to him and possibly through Luke. And uh, uh, we find references to those kinds of halls. Now, the Codex uh, Bizet uh, adds from the fifth hour to the tenth as the time allotted for Paul to work in this hall. And that would be be before midday until the close of the afternoon. Sort of what we think of as a siesta time in, in, in hot cultures, in hot climate cultures. And uh, so they, they'll t they take a break in the, from the noon to early afternoon, and that would be a time that many people are off work, or they take a siesta or whatever. That was the time that Paul was uh, apparently preaching. And uh, for a leisurely meal, maybe a nap, some sports, or visiting Paul at the School of Tyrannus. And they would reopen, they, get, they, they typically at 9.30 that night, that's cool. If you've visited Spain or some of those country, countries, you're familiar with that, that cycle of the day. Now it's interesting, just as at Corinth, Paul's greatest success was after his withdrawal to a separate place of meeting. And uh, he had faithful helpers, Epaphras is referred to, Chippus and Philemon are all names that come up frequently. And Erastus, Gaius, Aristarchus, Titus, Trophimus, and Tychicus, uh, they all established churches eastward, Colossa, uh, Laodicea, Hierapolis, and others. And also, probably, Spir uh, Smyrna, Thyatira, Pergamon, Philadelphia, and Sardis, which, of course, emerge in uh, Jesus' letters that constitute Re uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Now, Paul paid his expenses by working he had a vocation, making tents, and, we find, and uh, we'll find that more in the next chapter. But uh, he probably stayed with Priscilla and Achilla because they had that common trade, uh, a common interest between them. But it also says that he pastored from house to house. I'm always interested. Everything in the book of Acts seems to happen in, ho in, in homes. And uh, that's why I call it uh, the home, the once, and, the once and future church. That's where it all started, and that's where it's migrating today. Today, you can really sense the health of a nation by the degree that people are meeting in small groups during the week to study the Word of God. Verse 11, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought into, unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And the word, by the way, the word miracle here is dunamis, which is from which we get the word dynamite. These are real miracles going on here. But with handkerchiefs or aprons, this is, this is uh, very strange stuff. Now, when he says handkerchiefs, those are typically the sweatbands from somebody that's working hard. That's what they're really dealing with here. Aprons were the leather work aprons. So both of these items were byproducts of a of, of voca vocational effort. And uh, they were sought after because they were Paul's. And, uh, but we even see, uh, even in the, in the Mosaic period, even Moses had symbols, his staff, for an example, uh, Aaron's rod, and so forth. And uh, J J God will use these occasionally for miracles. See, God often does condescend to meet us in our own ignorance and weaknesses where he can reach us. It does, doesn't imply that these things were magical. It's just that God chose to use them there. There's a big difference there. And uh, it's a far, far uh, cry from those that on radio or television, that offer you know, off, give you give them give you if you give a special offering, they'll send you an, a handkerchief or something. Uh, don't, don't there's they have nothing to do with what's going on here. But there are biblical uses. There are bi biblical examples of uses of symbols of various kinds. Elijah had a notion that some of the power of Elijah resided in his mantle. You may recall, and uh, there is some even sought help from Peter's shadow. We read in Acts five back there and so on. But let's move on. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and, uh, chief, of the pri uh, and chief of the priests, which did so. 
It's kind of a strange thing here. Now, these are exorcists. These are occultists. But they're uh, endorsing or echoing Paul's ministry. That sounds like a positive. No, they just take, they're taking, trying to take advantage here is what's going on. Notice here, I want you to notice the article there, by the way. Uh, um, the Lord Jesus. As if to identify the magic word to demons with the addition of whom Paul preaches. They thought success turned on the correct use of a magical formula. They were trying to adapt and adopt a magical formula. That's what they're really after. And there were seven sons of Siva, a Jew, chief of the priests, which did this, took advantage of this. Now, the evil spirit answered and said, this is a demon-possessed guy, right? The, demon, the evil spirit answers and says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. But who are ye? <laughs> and the man in whom the evil spirit uh, uh, was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This one demon-possessed guy, the demon, you know, his reaction to these occultists, you know, Jesus we know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And they, this one guy overcomes seven, the seven sons of Ziva. And... Uh, now, some people, incidentally, if you dig into this with the, uh, with the expositors, you'll discover that some say the Greek implies only two. And that's, that's uh, uh, not quite correct. Is that um, in, in, in the language here, <coughs> the, uh, the term that's used there implies all seven. The word, what, like we, where we say both, it means two. But there, the Greek structure implies a plurality uh, of all of them. And, uh, uh, but it takes, it takes some depth of understanding of the Greek to get into that. Uh, even in Old English, the word both uh, means more than two. That's a, 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 so the, the, you have to be careful with the, uh, this is a place where some expertise and exegeti exegetical uh, work is useful. But in any case, it's obvious that these sons of Siva got the worst of it. And uh, I, I always think that's kind of, a, that would make a great movie scene, you know. And they overcame them. And uh, so one man became, overcame all seven of these guys. Jesus I know. Now the term there in the Greek means a, a deep, instinctive, innate knowledge. Okay. Paul I'm acquainted with. So you notice the personality of Satan's forces. They are personages that are sentient, knowledgeable, and very resourceful. The, that's what, there's a number, of par, a number of events in the Gospels and also here that one of the things we need to understand is that these creatures are real. These aren't euphemisms for some psychiatric problem or some obsession. No, they're being possessed. These are uh, sentient, uh, knowledgeable, uh, and very resourceful beings. So, Now, this is the fourth satanic encounter here. We had Simon Magus, you may remember. We had Elamos, our Jesus, the son of, and we had the Philippian uh, Pythonus. And so this is the fourth encounter that we've encountered here. Okay, verse 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. So the ministry is blooming here. This is a very major center in the in a, a, a primary Roman province. And the word is getting out. People are getting saved. And uh, on it goes. Now, <clears throat> Many of them also, which used curious arts, meaning occultic practices, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And uh, these books, we're not into burning books in our culture, but the real lesson here is some of these things are dangerous. And these are, these are weapons of Satan's warfare. And uh, see, human beings are not easily invaded. They, he can't bother you unless you give him permission, but you can inadvertently give him permission by what things you indulge in. And that can be Ouija boards, that can be seances, horoscopes. These are all things that can be used by the dark side. And we need to understand that these things are not harmless entertainments. These are not things that are not without their risks because they are what some people would call an entry. That's a way a, a demon can get a toehold. 
If, you re if you've read the book or saw the movie The Exorcist, William Blatty, the author, <coughs> I remember when Walter Martin was going to attack, uh, so set out to attack him thinking that that, that was, uh, uh, he hadn't done his homework and discovered that Blatty had done his homework. He actually wrote that novel based on some uh, several case studies. Uh, the case studies happened to be a young boy in New Jersey and the movie they made a, uh, was a girl, but the point is that uh, Blatty had done his homework and from, from that point of view it was accurate. Uh, Walter didn't like the way they ended the movie because they have Satan win in effect. But he had to yield because he realized Blatty had done his homework. But the point I'm getting, the reason I make reference to that, what started all those bizarre goings on, and they are based on a real case, a case study, is that, that it all started with this gal fooling around with a Ouija board. And that was an entry. That, that's what started the whole, the whole episode. So, and this goes for uh, uh, role-playing games and so forth. And I haven't kept up with the gaming industry, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised that some of the, the popular video games may be in that same category. Could be dangerous from an occultic point of view. And so these are all potentially weapons of Satan's warfare. And uh, so on we go. Now, Demetrius is going to confirm the tremendous influence of Paul's ministries in, in Ephesus in Asia. Uh, and we get to verse 26 coming down. But they really turned the place upside down. Forty years after this, Pliny in his famous letter to uh, Trajan from Bithynia will say of Christianity as follows. For the contagion of this superstition was not only spread through the cities, but also through the villages and country places. See, it was in th these uh, years these, that, uh, in Ephesus that Paul was greatly disturbed over the troubles in the Corinthian church, and he apparently wrote a letter to them on that is now lost to us. That's the reference in 1 Corinthians 5. We went through that uh, before last time. And after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. That was an aspiration of Paul. He probably had no realization that he was about to get to go to Rome on the gov at government expense. <laughs> so... He sent unto Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And uh, so he planned ahead. And uh, it's interesting that he uh, is, is, uh, makes big plans, but he also is very conscious of the needs of the believers in Judea. He makes a big thing of bringing them offerings. But the Corinthian problems, it's hard to really summarize all of this in just a brief summary here, but I'll do my best. There were three visits, we now know, and four letters. And we need to understand these three visits and four letters. And uh, the first visit, of course, was when the church was founded in Corinth. There's a reference in 1 Corinthians 5 of the previous letter. So there was a letter written that apparently has been lost. Chloe and so forth visit Paul's letter and bring him a letter from Corinth. And there's apparently big problems there. So that leads to what we know as 1 Corinthians. Paul wrote that to deal with those problems in the church that he had founded there. Then there's the painful visit, because he goes there, and uh, uh, it's a very, very painful visit. And he makes reference to that in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and 13. And on the result of that visit, he then writes the, what they call the severe letter, and that's re referenced in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul, after writing this severe letter, after that painful visit, is very concerned as to how it went over. He wrote the letter, but you know how sometimes is you may write a letter with a good heart, but he had a fear that it might, have, might not have been accept, received properly. So he's anxious to connect with Titus. And there's some difficulties in getting to Titus. When he finally catches up with Titus and Troas, he gets the, the report that it was well received. Okay. So he then writes a response to that that we have as 2 Corinthians. And uh, some people feel that 2 Corinthians is actually a composite of several letters, by the way, but that's a speculation. And that, of course, since uh, that's received well, that re results in a third visit. So there's three visits, four letters, and uh, uh, it's confusing because there's two of those letters, the pre what's called the previous letter and the severe letter, we don't have possessions of. And uh, so that's... Uh, there are some scholars that think there's portions of the severe letter that have been added into 2 Corinthians, but that's a, 
that's a manuscript thing for experts. But in any case, uh, there was a visit after the second Corinthian visit. So there's three visits, four letters. It's easy to get confused. And so let's recap here. Paul plans to go to Macedonia. He sends Timothy and Erastus ahead. And uh, they may also visit Corinth. And Paul is worried about immorality in the church. But uh, so he's, he's on his, he's, he's, uh, he writes 1 Corinthians to, to the Corinthians. And uh, then he visits and has the play, he hurries to Corinth because uh, the, the situation got, had gotten worse. And uh, so he, he left his work in Ephesus, paid that hurried visit. And uh, it's extremely painful for everyone. So he has to be severe. And that's implied in several of the passages in 2 Corinthians. Okay. And uh, so this, uh, the severe letter Paul determined to write another letter after that Obviously, very severe in tone, cost him much to write it. And had it not been successful, it could have meant a final rupture between Paul and the, the church that he had founded. And this letter seems to have been lost, but some people think it's 2 Corinthians and parts of it are in chapters 10 through 13. There's, it, it, it's possible. So that's the severe letter. <clears throat> so he's anxious to connect with Titus. He's up in Troas to connect with Titus to find out how it went. And... Uh, at about the same time, there was no small stir about that way. In other words, the way of, 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 of uh, Paul. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. It's a union. It's a craft, what they call a guild. And so he's, really, he's interrupting their form of, of uh, income. So anyway, Demetrius... Uh, he called, them, he called them together, the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. And so it's what we would call a trade union or a guild in those days. So this, this is celebrating Diana of the Ephesians. Now it's a pity that the revised version renders Artemis here. Diana, as uh, uh, the Ephesian Artemis, is quite distinct from the Greek Artemis, the sister of Apollo, the Diana of the Romans. See, both Greek and Romans use the term Artemis and Diana, but they're inverted, if you will. And so, anyway, the temple built in the 6th century B.C. was burnt by Herostratus in October 13th of 356, the very night that Alexander the Great was born. It was restored and was considered one of the seven wonders of the world, the temple here. And uh, the great festival in May would offer Demetrius a golden opportunity for the sale of the shrines. They sold, they sold these little shrines with silver dianas in them. And uh, that was their main, well, their main uh, industry. So he con he, uh, Demetrius continues, Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So here we're hearing from his enemies, again, a testimony that, of what an effective job Paul is doing. Demetrius continues, So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And, uh, you know, it's interesting how religious zeal is often uh, a, just a hypocritical pretext. Self-interest is... The real cause. Now this, uh, this place we're going to get into, the Agora, is about 300 square feet, a vestibule with about 400 more on top of that. And the gymnasium is about 450 by 370. It's a huge, about 15 acres of ground here we're dealing with. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. Now there's a picture of the theater in Ephesus, by the way. Uh, the Arcadian Way shown here is a marble street constructed in the reign of Emperor uh, Arcadius in about the 4th century. The street runs from the Middle Harbor Gate to the Greco-Roman Theater, which was built during the Hellenistic period. Gives you a feeling for the, this is the actual, actual picture of the place. And the theater is uh, about 660 feet in diameter. Two football fields, um, they're 40 feet uh, greater than the major axis of the Colosseum. Some say it's, a, there's different estimates, some say about 56,000 people could be there. Some say about half that, there's a scholastic debate about that. 
In any case, it's one of the seven wonders of the world, built about 550 BC out of pure white marble originally, on the night of the birth of Alexander the Great. And then it was rebuilt even more splendidly, obviously. And uh, so, when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent on him, desiring that he would not adventure himself into the theater. It was good advice. In other words, he was ready to do that, but the, the, the regulars there knew this, they were out of control. And it was a big mistake for Paul to, to do that. But he eludes, uh, he eludes them then. And uh, the fellow travels were, are mentioned several other places too, by the way, that traveled with him. And so, uh, we'll move on here. Asiarchs, uh, those are the political rulers of the province of Asia, uh, and they were responsible to the Romans. They were concerned and set word. It was th they're the ones that were concerned, not just for Paul, but they were afraid that uprising would get them in trouble with the Roman authorities. And that was part of the motivation. See, the Romans would not tolerate civil disorder. Uh, so they were in danger of losing their status as a free city, uh, which is presently unencumbered by direct Roman rule. That's a privilege they enjoyed they didn't want to lose. So the, the price of doing that was to make sure they kept order themselves. And so that's part of the dynamics going on here. Now what all happened in Ephesus isn't really known, but Paul makes some interesting remarks. He says, I have fought with the beasts of Ephesus in what, his letters. What does that mean? We're not sure. Some think that maybe they had lions or something, and, or maybe he's just using that metaphorically. We don't know. There's scholastic debate about that. Timothy will be, uh, had become the bishop of the church at Ephesus, by the way. But we'll move on to verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. And the more part knew not, wherefore they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. Now, is this the same Alexander as the coppersmith that's also referred in his letters to Timothy? That's debate about that. We don't know. Anyway, moving on. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You just see how a mob picks up a chant that drives them. They're emotional. They're irrational. They themselves don't know why they're there. But their, their enthusiasm is contagious. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image that fell down from Jupiter. See, that was the legend, the tradition that they held to. And uh, uh, that Artemis or Diana, whichever one you want to use, was fashioned from a meteorite is the theory. And Jupiter was, of course, their supreme god in their, in their pantheon. Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. See, they haven't done anything. Everybody's getting excited. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. So here we have some you know, r rational uh, uh, logic starting to reign here. And uh, this clerk's speech is, uh, uh, he says the, the uproar is undignified, unjustifiable, and unnecessary is his point. And he makes his point. For we are, uh, we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Very effective. Now, why is Luke putting all this in here? What's the point? This is one of the reasons I lean in the direction of those that believe that Luke is writing to the Roman authorities. Doc, he, he, they're addressed to Theophilus, but they, their purpose is to precede Paul in his appeal to Rome. Because when you appeal to Caesar, there, there were legal requirements, and, and some scholars believe that Luke want, volume 1 and volume 2 are the necessary legal documents uh, and as a prerequisite to Paul's appeal to, to Caesar. And so that's the, the point that's being emphasized here is the uproars were not because of Paul, it was the Jewish leadership. And in this case, of course, it quieted down. And after the uproar was ceased, 
Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go to Macedonia. And uh, now this is uh, uh, an inappropriate chapter division because this, this verse, the first verse of chapter 20 really should be part of 19. The exhortation is sufficiency is not of ourselves. Now Paul is the center of the riot in, uh, in Ephesus, obviously, and his message threatens the sale of the statues of the Ephesian goddess, as we've seen. Now, in anxiety over the, the possible effect of his drastic, severe letter to Corinth, he's in, and he's impatient over Titus's delay. He was supposed to connect with Titus by now. He travels north to Macedonia, and, uh, he, and he finally encounters Titus in Philippi. And uh, he, he gets the good news that the, thing, the letter was well received. So... Now, Luke's brevity requires culling details from the epistles. We put, we put many of these pieces together by going carefully through the letters that Paul wrote and try to piece these things together. There are many visits that are not recorded by Paul to Albania and Yugoslavia, for an example. And uh, he had dispatched Titus to Corinth, but now anxious to meet him in Troas, and anxious to find out how did that severe letter go. Now, his concern for being overdue causes Paul to leave for Macedonia. He lands, of course, at Philippi. And at length, Titus arrives with better tidings that Paul had dared to expect. It was much better than he thought, and that it's a huge relief for Paul. And that's when he writes the second letter to the, uh, uh, to the Corinthians and dispatching Titus with that letter. And so that puts a whole different color on, on the second letter to Corinth, obviously. And so, so he writes a fourth letter, really. We call it Second Corinthians. Uh, which re he recounts his former anxiety and expresses his joy over uh, the reform in Corinth. And he obviously visited Corinth shortly thereafter. So it brings you up to date there. And uh, So the second verse of chapter 20, when he had gone over those parts, he had given them much exhortation. He came into Greece and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, he was about to sail into Syria. He purposed to return through Macedonia. And uh, so he, uh, he plans to travel to Jerusalem by sea, but a plot by his enemies forced him to return through Macedonia. And so uh, he writes Romans about this time, but then he goes by land uh, back to Philippi. And there accompanied him to Asia, Sopater of Berea, and uh, of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Segundus, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timotheus of Asia, and of, and of Asia, Tachycus and Trophimus. So he rounds up his friends as he goes here. These going before tarried for us at Troas. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them in Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And so they now are there back in Troas. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now this, by the way, is one of the first one of the places which speaks of the first day of the week. Some people make a big thing of this. Some scholars argue on the basis of this and one other verse that they, they always met on the first day of the week on Sunday. Well, they were Jewish, so Sunday might be really Saturday night, but let's not get into that one. There are other cases, though. The other quote is in 1 Corinthians 16 where he asked them to collect the money on the first day of the week so they wouldn't gather when they meet. So there's a debate about that among many as to what they all gets around to you. Do you worship, does a Christian work, worship on Shabbat or on Sunday? You can take your pick because anything's uh, encouraged. But this is one of the verses that comes up in those discussions. And, uh, okay. <clears throat> there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. Now, lights there are candles. They're, they're, they're consuming uh, oxygen. And he's preaching for six hours, okay. And uh, so that... Uh, that's what, they, that's what they define preaching as. Preaching is speaking in somebody else's sleep, right? And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. This is what some people call Eutychus' fall from grace, right? <laughs> in any case, the Greek plainly indicates that he was taken up lifeless. There's a debate among scholars. Did he, was he really dead or was he not? And people have different views on that. But uh, 
Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him, said, Trouble not yourself, for his life is in him. So some say that he really wasn't dead. Others say the Greek implies that, that Paul raised him from the dead. And uh, that Paul's approach of falling on the young man is the same thing that Elijah, the dead of the son woman of uh, Sarepta, did in 1 Kings 17. And Elisha did with the dead son of the Shunammite in 2 Kings 4. So those are patterns that are being followed here. Jesus did the same thing in, Matthew, in uh, Mark 5 and Luke 8. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till the break of day, so he departed. That's Paul we're talking about. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. There again, the Greek implies hey, he really had been dead and he's back to life. But some scholars, uh, the Greek, he was raised from the dead, not just unconscious. But there's a scholastic debate in the background if you want to get into it. And we went before him to ship and sailed a unto Assos, there intending to take in Paul, for so he had he appointed, minding himself to go on foot. That's 35 miles by sea we're talking about, but it's 20 by land. And Paul apparently had a desire for privacy, prayer, and solitude. So that was his choice. He'd rather walk and let them sail. And uh, it was feasible. And, we, and when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came to the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. Now Miletus is not Ephesus. He actually is deliberately missing Ephesus. He chose a ship apparently that deliberately did not stop at Ephesus. He goes to Miletus and then sends for the elders to come meet him there. This will be clear when I show you a map here. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So he's anxious to get to Jerusalem. So if he goes to Ephesus, he'd get tangled up with crowds and so forth. By having the elders come and meet him, he gives his famous farewell address to them, very key place in Acts 20, that we'll get to here in a minute. But... Uh, so the overland trip was, was due to the, the plot discovery, obviously. And so, uh, okay, so he's, this shows you on the map, we went to Assos, and then they sail around. That is not actually to Ephesus. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, a message that is, and called the elders of the church to come meet him at Miletus. And Miletus is about 15 miles south of Ephesus, and he stayed there for three or four days. Here's, it gives you a feeling of the, the uh, geography here. The, uh, uh, he deliberately, he's coming from the north. He doesn't stop at Ephesus. He goes a little further to Miletus and has the, the leaders, the, the elders, come from Ephesus to Miletus. Uh, and it could be, for, it could be uh, there's all kinds of speculation why he did that. Um, there are problems with, with uh, uh, both harbors to some extent. But I think it was just to avoid the crowd, if you will. He wanted to be, have some private time just with the elders. And so we now we're going to encounter the farewell address to the Ephesian elders. Very important. It's great advice. Very relevant to them. It's also very relevant to us. And that gets all underscored because Jesus later, in his letter to the Ephesians, uh, makes reference to this in effect. And it's probably the most poignant of all Paul's addresses here. So verse eight, uh, Acts 20, uh, verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And uh, so, see, the condition of the apostle, remember, his conditions were always under great danger. With all the rest going on, he was always in, uh, exposed, vulnerable. And he continues, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly, friend, from house to house. And I like this house to house. I think we should really be paying attention to that. That's the way they operated. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. 
Paul's own spirit. And uh, save that the Holy Ghost witness in every city saying that the bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Wow. Verse 27 is a very key verse. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That's a very key phrase. By the way, some people make the claim that Paul never declared that Jesus was God. That's a mistake because it's all through the scripture. And here he does that, say that very thing. But the other thing, the all the counsel of God. The whole counsel of God is your best assurance against heresies of any kind. All of us study the word. We, we want to be very cautious and not indulge in one verse theology. You want to understand the whole counsel. One th reason that eschatology is so difficult for many is because it really requires the whole council to be in order to tie it all together. If your view about a certain thing doesn't fit the whole council, then it requires re-examination. And so that's really a call to, to a strategic grasp of the whole council of God. I declare unto you all the counsel of God. Very important. Paul says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Boy, could we talk, spend an hour on this verse. After my departing shall grievous wolves enter in. And they certainly did. Did the elders take heed? Yes, they did. Because Jesus is going to give them a, a, a grade of A on that aspect. There's other things they didn't do, and he'll deal with that. But they apparently really were zealous for, for uh, uh, dealing with the false teachers. It's that fact, he says, also of your own selves shall men arise. In other words, some of your enemies will rise from among your own, speaking perverse things. Why? To draw away disciples after them. I want to ask for a show of hands of how many can think of examples in our own life, in our own uh, community, in our own, uh, on our own horizon of false teachers, and sometimes springing from within a congregation, calling division, ca causing divisions and separations. Grievous wolves, perverse men. There are two classes of enemies, external and internal, and both are in view here. There'll be grievous wolves from the outside, but there's also enemies from the inside. And the church is always hurt the most from the inside. It may not be many years before Epaphras will come to Rome from Colossae with news of a new peril there. That was in the epistle of Colossians. In writing to Timothy, Paul will warn him against some who have already made a shipwreck of their faith in 1 Timothy 1. John will present Jesus as describing these very false apostles in Ephesus in his letter in Revelation chapter 2. Now, there's no fewer than six false teachers from Ephesus, by the way. We have uh, Hymenaeus in 1 Timothy 1, Alexander in 1 Timothy 1, we have Phygelus in 2 Timothy 1, we have Hermogenes in 2 Timothy 1, Philetus in 2 Timothy 2, Diotrophes, Diotrophes in 3 John, and, uh, and we have a reference to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in Revelation chapter 2. In fact, several times in Revelation. And where is, there, where is the light stand of Ephesus? Remember, Jesus said, told Ephesus, that if you don't deal with the things you've got to fix, I'm going to remove your lampstand. Where is the lampstand of Ephesus today? It's been removed, interestingly enough. Now, the epistle to Colossians, which was written about the same time to, uh, to, to its neighbor, uh, uh, it was a neighbor of Ephesus, um, 
that it evidences the propagation of Gnostic errors in proconsular Asia. One thing that was starting to surface that comes up is the Gnosticism. The whole study of Gnosticism is another study. We won't derail this study to get into that, but just be aware of that as a, something they had to deal with. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. Boy, that's your picture of Paul. For three years, I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. <coughs> Here's a teacher that cares. And now, brethren, I commend to you God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Very key verse, by the way. The sanctification is linked to your inheritance. Inheritances are things that are due you if you're sanctified, but they're also things you can forfeit if you're not diligent and not faithful. And so he, he uh, I commend to you, God, and to, be wor and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. To give you an inheritance. So we're not speaking here about the initial sta stages of salvation, but the subsequent stages of upbuilding, even to the consummation of a final inheritance. And here it's ascribed to the ability of God to bestow it as in Romans 16, Ephesians 3, and Jude, and so forth. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Four ways. To admonish with tears, speaking the truth in love. To use the word itself. To be selfless in your ministry. It is better to give than to receive. These are the four things that he emphasizes. <laughs> and uh, Athenaeus, a Greek poet, says just the obvious. The, the, giver, the giver is foolish, but the receiver is fortunate. No, no. Let's go on here. Verse 33. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, Ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. So he's earning his own way. That's what he's making reference to, his tent making. And uh, he wasn't there for the money, so to speak. He earned his own living. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, what's interesting about that, you cannot find that in the Scripture. Many people don't realize that. You will not find that phrase. Paul is quoting a phrase of Lord Jesus that we don't have anywhere else. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. It's more blessed to, the, to, to give than to receive. We hear, we, that is used so often when people make a call for do offerings. And I believe Jesus said that, but it's quite interesting to notice that we, we are indebted to Paul for that. That's not found among the recorded sayings. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Now, by the way, they did see his face one more. First Timothy hints that he did end up going back there once more time, one more time. And according to Jesus' letter to Ephesus, they apparently heeded Paul's admonition regarding false teachers. That was the good news. Every one of the, the, uh, the seven letters, seven churches have good news and bad news. There's two that have no good news. And there's two that have no bad news. But that's basically the structure. Ephesus had the good news was they did deal with the false teachers. That's the good news. They listened. They followed Paul's admonition. The bad news was they lost their first love. They, had so, they were so busy on the business of the king, they didn't have time for the king. And they, they, they were weak on their devotional side. That's probably, all of us are probably guilty of that. That they really established priority and prioritized time for devotion. Now John, by the way, spent his last three, uh, final years in, as a bishop of Ephesus and he also there was a custodian for Mary. You remember Jesus gives the responsibility for Mary to John and he follows through with that. And they both uh, finish their days in Ephesus. In fact, John even writes her a personal letter that most people don't recognize. We know it as Second John. And uh, you can check into that. Okay, for the next session, we want you to study three chapters.
chapters 21, 22, and 23. They're short, and uh, we can, we can uh, uh, I think, uh, accomplish that in, in the next session. And so let's stand for a closing word of prayer.